Good morning. Welcome to worship on this um, kind of cool day. And it's the last Sunday of June. So what does that mean tomorrow? July the 1st and Canada Day. Yeah. So happy Canada Day weekend, everyone. Um, before we start, I just want to take a moment to think about the land that we're located on here in Dorchester. I know this isn't relevant for Don up in Alberta, but it is for us. Um, well, it's true that we're the current stewards of this land, and it's not always so. Prior to the London Township purchase in 1796, also known as Treaty 6, there were other peoples here who were stewards of this land. The Anishinaabe, the Mississauga, and the Attawandarong. And before there were people, the land was. As indigenous people and Christians of European descent, we acknowledge that the land which sustains us all, the land on which we live and move and have our being, belongs to God, our Creator. Okay, so thank you for everyone who uh, helped make uh, Holy Diner last Thursday a wonderful success. Whether you helped with setup or the work or whether you were just here to eat and have fellowship. Thank you, it was a wonderful success and we look forward to building the numbers throughout the season, right? <laughs> And, and wearing out the volunteers by the end of it. Um, so next Thursday is again. Um, are there announcements that people needed to make?
Okay. Birthdays, anniversaries, other celebrations. Well, there, there is one birthday in the house this coming week. Um, Wednesday is um, my wife's birthday. Uh, she'll be 29 again. Yeah, I think we should sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Barbara. Happy birthday to you. And right after church, we're going to skedaddle because <clears throat> we have reservations in London. So um, if there are no other celebrations, we will move on. And I'll ask Brian if he would come up and light the grace candle for us. Your word, O oh God, is a lamp to our feet. And a light for our path. Thank you, Brian. So you know what that picture is that's on there? Well, it looks like a candle, but it isn't really. It's an oil lamp. And this is the kind of oil lamp that people would have used in their habitation in Jesus' day. And so it's made of clay, and it would be filled with olive oil and would have a wick in there of some sort, maybe an old um, garment that was no longer suitable for wear would be cut up and made into wicks. So that's what they would have lit the house. Remember the story about the lady uh, who held the lamp up and swept the house looking for the coins she lost? Dark it would be in the house with only a couple of lamps. So we take a moment to still ourselves and to prepare our hearts to worship God. I'd invite you to join in the call to worship. Come am among us, Creator God. We wait for you. We come yearning for your word and blessing. Come among us, compassionate Christ. We hope in you. We come among you, we hope in your embrace. Come among us, Spirit of life. We wait and hope in you. We come eager to rest in the embrace of your peace. Okay, so because tomorrow's Canada Day, I thought we'd sing O Canada. Now, I remember when we were, when I was at, at school, at seminary, in, in our worship class, there was a big, big discussion about whether or not O Canada belonged in the hymn book. Because is it a hymn or not? Is it a nationalistic thing? And, and the way they, we sort of decided in the class, including the professor, is that if it was all four verses, it was a hymn. Of course, there's only one verse in, in the Voices United. So anyway, we're going to sing all four verses because that way it's a hymn. So I would invite you to stand as we sing O Canada Day. Oh, my God. 
So now maybe it makes sense why the discussion in our worship class went the way it did when you see the words for the fourth verse. This is really what makes it a hymn. I invite you to join in our opening prayer. It helps now and then, O oh God, to step back and take a long view. Summertime is the perfect time to do just that. When we step back and take a long view, we realize that your kingdom is not only beyond our effort, it is even beyond our vision. We realize that all we accomplish in our lifetime is only a fraction of the enterprise, which is your work. Nothing we ever do can be complete. Your kingdom always lies beyond us. No prayer can fully express our faith. No confession can make us perfect. No program can accomplish your church's mission. No set of human goals and objectives can include everything. All we can do is plant seeds that will one day grow. We can water seeds that others have planted, trusting in their future promise. 
We can lay foundations that will need further development. We can provide yeast that will produce effects beyond our capabilities. We find a sense of liberation when we realize that we cannot do everything. That realization enables us to do something and to do it well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, and an opportunity for your grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results of what we begin, but that is the difference between you and us. We are workers, not architects, ministers, not messiahs. Be with us. Grant us a vision of the future you dream of. Bless our efforts to move towards that grand vision of yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so speaking of no statement can ever fully express our faith, we try and do just that with the new creed. So I would invite you to stand as you're able, and we'll recite the, the creed of uh, the United Church. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And we're going to sing number 120. Oh, Jesus, I have promised. And if you would rather sit, sit. If you'd rather stand, stand however you're comfortable.
Our hymn today is Psalm number 130. depths I have called to you, O God, hear my cry. Let your ears be attentive to my plea for mercy. If you should keep account of what is done amiss, O God, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, therefore we will honor you. I wait for you, God, my soul waits, and in your word is my hope. My soul waits for God, more than the watchers long for the morning, more than the watchers long for the morning. O Israel, wait in hope, for with God there is love unfailing. With God is great power to redeem, to redeem you, Israel, from all your sins. And the scripture today is taken from the Gospel of, of Mark. Listen for the word of God. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? His disciples said to him, You can see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. 
he strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and he told them to give her something to eat. May God add a blessing on the reading of this holy word and forever write its meaning in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. sort of interesting that in that passage there's a story with a story set in the middle of it, right? You start one story and then you go to a completely different story and then you finish the first story. Sort of sounds like the way my stepfather used to talk to you and some of my professors too. You never knew exactly what it was you were supposed to be, which story to concentrate on. So I was in a coffee shop recently. The place was packed. It was so busy that people who didn't know each other were sharing tables because there was nowhere else to sit. And I overheard the conversation two businessmen were having. One said to the other as they were sitting down, I only have two questions. What business are you in, and how's business? Boy, that's a conversation that could take a long time to have and happen. What business are you in, and how's business? Those are two questions that I sometimes think we need to ask in the church. What business is the church in, and how's business? I think most of you could answer the second question with relative ease, but I, I got to thinking, I wonder what people would say about the first question. So what business is the church in? Anybody? Oh, this is not a good sign. Worshiping God. To serve the community, which is the same thing when you think about it, right? It's just how you do it is maybe a little differently. What else? Oh, Kindness to other people. Yep. I'll give you a hint. Jesus said, I have come to... Heal the brokenhearted, make the blind see, bind up the lame. Remember? I think really the answer is transformation. That's the business the church is in, transformation. Transform lives, your life. And your life, and your life, and your life, and everybody's life, individually, and then transform the world. So the story of the hemorrhaging woman, 12 years she focused entirely on her medical condition. Every penny, every ounce of energy, every thought, every effort went to stopping the flow of blood. And the flow meant that she was ritually unclean and had to separate herself from people. She could not sit or sleep where others sat or slept, or to sit where she had sat would render one ritually unclean as she was unclean. And then with the touch of a tassel, she was whole and clean once again. Her life was transformed in an instant. And I don't mean just her health. I mean her entire life was utterly transformed. No longer did her condition consume her every thought or her very life. 
now that she was clean once more, she was free to be with people, to sit at the table and break bread with them, to mingle with them in the marketplace and not have to worry about, oh, if somebody bumps into me, they'll be unclean. She could hug a friend or hold the hand of a child. For 12 years, her every thought had been turned inward on herself. And now, she could turn the focus outward. Now she could be with and think of others and she could thank God for her cure. So at a continuing education class I was at several years ago, we learned about the institutional church. And they were talking about how the church has been chronically ill and church leaders and churchgoers seem to be completely at a loss as to how to turn things around. And for hundreds of years, the church has operated as an institution on an attractional basis. You know, sort of like a Tim Hortons franchise. Build it and they'll come. It has sought members to join. It's created mission statements. It's elected officers. It's encouraged endowments. It's measured assets, made budgets, received pledges. It's celebrated increases in numbers, built with bricks and mortar, depended on human resources to accomplish attainable goals, recruited people to serve on committees, relied on donations, dedicated monuments to memorialize past accomplishments. It's trained its leaders to manage. It's also been inwardly focused, existing primarily for the sake of members. It sought prestige to be first and best. It became maintenance oriented, and I don't just mean maintenance of the building, although that's part of what I mean. I mean that it's become focused on maintaining the institution, the courts of the church, committees, boards, regional councils, national office. The church, the one that operates as an attractional institution, its days are numbered. And I really didn't need to go to a course to learn that. It's obvious. The signs are all around us and have been for some decades now. What we did learn was that there's a new church, a transformed church, emerging from the old. And this emerging church operates more like a movement than an institution. The word given to describe it is incarnational. How is it different than an attractional church? Well, the church that we're all familiar with is the attractional church, right? So what's the difference? Instead of seeking members to join, seeks a need to fulfill. Instead of having a mission statement, it has a mission. Instead of electing officers, it seeks to inspire passionate people. Oh, I can't help but think of your granddaughter right now, Carol. <laughs> Instead of encouraging endowments, it encourages selfless living. Instead of measuring assets, it measures passion. Instead of making budgets and receiving pledges, it makes commitments and gives everything. Instead of celebrating an increase in numbers, it celebrates lives changed. Instead of building with bricks and mortar, it builds with flesh and blood. Instead of depending on human resources to accomplish attainable goals, it depends on God's resources to accomplish 
seemingly impossible visions. Instead of recruiting people to serve on committees, it seeks to attract people to change the world. You know, that's the one thing about committees. It's like once you're on them, like you're on them, like it's a lifetime commitment, right? You're on them till you're dead. And, and, and the new generation, they, they don't like running marathons. They want to run a sprint. So far better to have a task group that has one job, like the task group that's going to put on one event, and then you're, and then you're done. And you might join another task group after that, but they like sprinting, a whole bunch of sprints rather than a big marathon. Instead of relying on donations, it relies on self-sacrifice and the grace of God. Instead of dedicating monuments to past accomplishments, it celebrates lives transformed and then moves on. Instead of training its leaders to manage, it creates leaders who are willing to die for the mission. Ouch, that one pinches. Instead of having an inward focus, it has an outward focus, existing for others. Instead of seeking prestige, it seeks sacrifice, serving the last and the least, the unloved, the unlovely, the unlovable. Instead of being maintenance oriented, it's mission driven. This new emerging incarnational church is led by people who are called by God, not by people who have the right academic qualifications. It challenges people to go and serve, not to come and join. It provides risky opportunities, not a safe environment where nothing ever changes. It invites passionate people to fulfill a mission, not accepting resumes to fill job descriptions. And this is the church that will survive. It's a church that's been transformed. So tomorrow is Canada Day, and I have two questions. What in our country needs to be transformed? And number two, how can the church play a role in that transformation? As for the first, I would say that we are beneficiaries of those who came before us. Those who, although they may have been well-intentioned in their day, did harm to the people who already occupied this land. One thing that needs transformation, perhaps more than anything else, is the relationship between First Nations peoples and those who've come here over the last 500 years, give or take a year. As to the second question, how do we do this? That's up to all of us to figure out. The relationship between First Nations and newcomers is like the hemorrhaging woman's problem. It's a problem that's existed for many years and will continue to exist for years to come. It's a problem that much money has been thrown at, yet it still persists. It's a drain on our resources, and I don't mean just money. What we really need is to be able to reach out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment or perhaps just be willing to reach out and have our hearts touched by one another. In a book that I just recently finished reading on the Apostle Paul, 
the author argues that Paul, in talking about works of law and faith, declares that law establishes information, not transformation. Law informs conscience from outside, externally. Faith, by which Paul means a relationship of commitment and trust, is what empowers conscience internally. Faith is what drives transformation. In other words, commitment to and trust in one another is what makes transformation possible. So let's go and transform the things in our country that really need transforming and make this country an even better place to live and work and play for each and every person in this country, First Nation and newcomer alike. And may God be with us all in our journey. Amen. Missing number 288, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
seated. Okay, I got two prayer requests this morning before church. Are there any other prayer requests? Okay, so we've got the two this morning and a whole bunch that are in the silence of our hearts. Creator God, you made icy cold springs for hot summer days. Grassy, Grassy meadows just right for bare feet. Color changing leaves for kids to play in. A garden of wonders place just for us. Remind us of the home you built for us, lest we be tempted to build walls that divide. Help us to create a home for you in our hearts, that you might live in us every day, not just for brief visits when the guest room is available. Bless your church. May it be a place of refuge and hope for all in need. This week we pray especially for Roundtree Memorial Church in London and their spiritual leader, the Reverend Wendy Noble. We pray for all your people the world over. May they live in peace with one another and secure in the knowledge of your love for all. This week we pray especially for the people of Sudan, South Sudan, and Uganda. Comfort all who mourn. May they comprehend the blessing they received in knowing their beloved as well as the grief of their loss. We pray especially for the friends and family of Alan Weir and Dawn Laidlaw. Grant strength and courage and healing to all who are ill or dying, awaiting medical intervention or recovering from treatment. Especially we think of Marion Jenkins, Russ Zavitz, Sheila Duffin, and their families and loved ones and caregivers and those known only in the silence of our own hearts. All this we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray, singing. said, Amen. 
As children, our parents taught us to share whatever we had. Jesus, too, bids us share our blessings. As mature Christians, we do so through our tithes and offerings. Our tithes and other offerings will be received. What can I do? What can I do? What can I bring? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I say? What can I sing? What can I sing? I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. And I'd invite you to join me in prayer. Holy One, out of the abundance we are blessed with, we present our tithes and offerings. They are a sign of our commitment to your call to be a blessing to the world, to transform life for the hurting and broken, the lost and lonely, the marginalized and oppressed, the hungry and the homeless. Accept and bless these offerings that they may be used to offer hope to those whose lives are devoid of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Carol. And our closing hymn is number 416, Fourth in Your Name, O Christ. this place differently than when we arrived. We have been changed in mind, body, body and, spirit. and spirit. We have been changed by worshiping as a community. Now, now we, we go to change the world in which we live, one act of loving kindness at a time, one, one person, person at a time, until God's dream is fully realized in this world as in heaven. Walk with mercy and with God's humble 